welcome back everyone to day two of our bicentenary conference. We had a wonderful day yesterday learning about New South Wales' place in the world of empire in the 1820s. The 1823 Act, as well as then delving into the history of Chief Justices of New South Wales over at the Supreme Court. Before we commence today, I'd just like to take the opportunity to promote a couple of resources um, that are available to you all. The Parliamentary Library uh, this year has been publishing something called a Bills Assist, a new web-based resource that provides a centralised location where you can learn more about bills that are before the Parliament, media coverage and much more. Can I also encourage you to sign up to the House in Review blog? I know a number of you are already um, subscribers, but for those of you who aren't, please take the opportunity to sign up. It's a blog published in the days following each sitting of the Legislative Council, and it summarises a quick-to-read um, overview of legislation debated, committee inquiries, papers tabled, significant procedural moments, and other business before the House. We'll be sending uh, links to both of those resources to each of you after the conference, along with your feedback form. So please look out for that email. We've got another exciting day scheduled for today. I'm sure you've each got your programs in front of you, so I won't go through the detail of the program we've got ahead. Um, I will just mention, though, that at the conclusion of Anne Toomey's talk, the conference will finish with a tour of Bamali's powerful and impactful exhibition in the Fountain Court. And also the tour will take in the Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council Chambers and the President's Suite. To introduce our first speakers this morning, I'd like to welcome the Honourable Damien Tudorhope, MLC. Mr Tudorhope is a member of the Liberal Party and leader of the opposition in the Legislative Council. He's Shadow Treasurer and Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations. Under the previous government, he served as leader of the government in the Legislative Council, Vice President of the Executive Council and Minister for Finance and Small Business. Now I read here that Mr Tudorhope is passionate about tennis and cricket. He is an avid supporter of the Sydney Swans and is co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of the Sydney Swans and the Parliamentary Friends of Religious Freedom. As Shadow Treasurer, Damien Tudorhope is a particularly good sport to have agreed to this morning introduce his nemesis, the Treasurer. <laughs> or is he actually introducing his apprentice? <laughs> and will he be introducing him or roasting him? Well, let's find out, Mr Tudorhope. <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. Mr. Clark, um, I'm indebted to the clerk always for his advice, and uh, thank you, all, everyone, for being here this morning. This, this series is such an important part of preserving the history of this this place and the things that we do in this place, and it's a, a great pleasure of mine to be able to participate even in this very small role. Um, so it's my task today to uh, be begin this session by introducing Daniel Mulkey, my nemesis, but, uh, but in fact, no, my nemesis, but also my friend. Um, and also to introduce adjunct associate professor Carol Liston, who will take us back in time to hear about the very beginnings of colonial treasury. The first colonial treasurer was a fellow called William Balcom, who was appointed on the 2nd of October, 1823. And I was doing some uh, small research in relation to Mr Balcom. And uh, when he first arrived in Australia, it appeared that uh, uh, Bathurst or Brisbane wasn't quite clear as to what the scope of his new office would be. Uh, the financial arrangements in New South Wales at the time were somewhat diffuse. And this is an example of the more things change, the more th they stay the same, let me tell you. The colony's finances had been administered by the commissary, the treasurer of the, of the police fund and the naval officer uh, and the treasurer of the orphan fund. Colonial revenue at this time was raised by, this is, this is what, how we earned our money, royalties on timber and coal, fees on shipping, import duties, wharf taxes, auction duties or stamp duty, 
mark, market and fair duties, fees paid on cap, cattle slaughtering and, most importantly, tolls on public bridges and roads. <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. But it gets more interesting because uh, in the 1830s, uh, the government in London and the governor in Sydney acted slowly to improve the administration of the Treasury. It was necessarily slow, as every recommendation from the governor had to travel 16,000 sea miles and took about three months. Conversely, every dispatch from the Secretary of State took as long. If there were disagreements, they could take months, if, if not years, to resolve. Consequently, in 1836, the Office of the Collector of Internal Revenue was subsumed within the Office of the Colonial Treasurer. And what happened then? This action, action, this action re caused the then Treasurer, Campbell Drummond Riddell, to immediately claim an increase in his salary. This action occasioned a protest from within the Legislative Council when John Blacksland gave it as his opinion that the duties of that office, that is the Office of Treasurer, uh, were demanding of little talent or acquirement of any kind. <laughs> Bear that in mind, Daniel. <laughs> so who are our two speakers today? I begin with introducing Carol Liston, an Australian historian who specialises in the history of New South Wales from 1788 uh, to 1860. Her research covers early colonial history with interests in people, local history, heritage and the built environment. She holds a particular interest in the colonial development of the County of Cumberland, Greater Western Sydney, using land records, family history and surviving buildings to document the past. She is also the co-editor of the Journal of the Royal Australian Historical Society. Our second guest is the Treasurer of New South Wales, Daniel Mookie. The Treasurer, as uh, the clerk uh, correctly pointed out, is a regular sparring partner of mine going back many years to when he was a humble shadow finance minister and I had just entered Cabinet. We, had bo we both entered Parliament in 2015, although in different houses, where I learnt skills in the other place. I took a term to see the light and then I joined him in the Legislative Council where we continue our contest of ideas. I hope that when Parliament sits or he's facing a grilling in budget estimates, I make him long for those Hallison days where the colonial treasurer didn't have to face an op op opposition counterpart. The treasurer is a worthy adversary and someone well respected on all sides. I'm sure today it will be an enlightening discussion, so please join me in welcoming the treasurer and associate professor Liston. <laughs> Well, good morning, and thank you to the civic leaders and the citizens who have gathered here in the Parliamentary Theatre to celebrate our democracy and to mark 200 years of responsible government here in New South Wales, and uh, which coincides with the 200th anniversary of the New South Wales Treasury as well. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Gadigal, and I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and affirm the New South Wales Government's ongoing solidarity with all First Nations people as we strive to deliver justice and equality for all our citizens as well. I I also want to acknowledge uh, many of the guests who are here here. Uh, the President of the Upper House, Ben Franklin, who otherwise keeps us in check. Uh, my good, good friend, the Shadow Treasurer, <coughs> Damien Judah, who, uh, dare I say, when I was told was introducing me, I told my staff, take comfort in this. He doesn't have parliamentary privilege in the theatre uh, <laughs> as, as well. I do wish to acknowledge the Auditor General of New South Wales, uh, Miss Margaret Crawford PSM, who I often say is the higher power we in Treasury all answer to. And of course, uh, the clerk, the usher of the black rod who has the power to arrest us all, you don't, might not know that, uh, as well as Associate Professor David Roberts, uh, Miss Sue Williams and Professor Frank Bongiorno as well. Uh, I'm really pleased to join you this morning to, uh, and to join Associate Professor Karen Liston from Western Sydney University to talk about the early years of the New South Wales Treasury. Uh, this is, uh, Miss Professor Liston is currently uh, writing one of the 15 chapters of a 200 year uh, history of the Treasury 
which will be published next year when the Treasury marks its 200th anniversary. And Professor Liston's chapter is an examination of the colonial economy prior to and after the establishment of the colonial treasury was triggered, was triggered by the Biggs report. And of course, John Biggs' seminal inquiry actually comprised three volumes, the State of the Colony of New South Wales in 1822, the judicial establishments of New South Wales and of Van Diemen's land, and the state of agriculture and trade in the colony of New South Wales. Now, 200 years ago, New South Wales was changing uh, its currency from British sterling to Spanish dollars as currency in the mid 1820s. And indeed, uh, I'd encourage lots of people to go visit the Powerhouse Museum, where you, if you, you, what, if you were to go there, what you will see is a coin collection of all the different forms of legal tender that was acceptable in the colony uh, into the lead up to 1823. And this included the Spanish holy dollar, but actually, for my own things, the Indian rupee and many of these other currencies across the world that were all accepted as legal tender here until the colony was of the view that perhaps it had reached sufficient scale to issue its own currency. It's an amazing collection uh, that was recently displayed at the New South Wales Treasury. Of course, introducing a new treasury created accounting and political issues for the time. And the first colonial treasurer, William Balcom, had to deal with this, plus the emergence of private banks in the late 1820s that then collapsed in the depression of the 1840s. And again, if people have been recently reading David Marr's new work, uh, which is an amazing story about uh, the life, well, what life in the colony was for Indigenous Australians at this point in time, they would understand the correlation between the collapse of the private banks in the 1830s and the formation of Queensland, as well as how it led to the Legislative Council embarking on a period of expansion of the colony at the expense of First Nations. And indeed, many of the events which are now being recorded by our historians about violence on the frontier uh, can be traced back to the collapse of wool prices in the 1830s, which brought on the, the collapse of the private banking sector here in New South Wales, which then caused the council to, in effect, resolve some of the fiscal tensions by embarking upon a policy of land extensions. This, of course, led to political infighting involving the colonial treasurer, and it was one of the reasons why Governor Burke resigned at the beginning of 1837. And though I'm glad the Premier's not here, uh, because otherwise uh, I would, uh, I'm sure he would take offence in in me making the point that the one responsibility of treasurers going back now 200 years has been to fight governors and premiers who are embarking on too much fiscal expansion at a time where the economy can't afford. It's good to know, as the shadow treasurer says, as some things change, some things don't. The economic issues which the British government as the real treasury uh, made the point of uh, these pressures lasted until the gold rushes and self-government. Now, a lot of this story will be told in the uh, publication that Treasury will be making next year, which is the Bicentennial History of 15 Chapters. But what I wanted to talk about a bit more today was the connection that I have, uh, not a particularly good one actually, with the very first colonial treasurer, William Balcom. Because whilst it's right for us to record him as the first colonial treasurer, we should actually take this opportunity to reflect on his background. And again, uh, William Balcom, our first colonial treasurer, served between 1824 and 1829, but he was far more famous for his time of service in St Helena with the East India Company uh, at the same time Napoleon was exiled there. And indeed, uh, what's forgotten is that when Napoleon was effectively recaptured at Waterloo and sent to St Helena to spend his dying days, he was sent to St Helena at the time because it was a waypoint in the Atlantic trade. And when we say the Atlantic trade, we should reflect on the fact that the Atlantic trade was a key part of the triangle, which was the slave trade at the time. And William Balcom was the master of uh, effectively that outpost, and as, which was a trading station that was selling goods and services, goods and services to ships that were passing through. And uh, he was working for the East India Company as a purveyor of sales uh, 
And whilst it's not true whether or not precisely he was involved in the direct trade of slaves, it's quite clear that the customs and the duties he was imposing in St Helena's was certainly correlated very strongly with the slave trade. He was in St Helena until 1880 before being sacked and sent to New South Wales as the first colonial treasurer because he was considered too friendly with Napoleon. And he was considered as a person who was perhaps furnishing Napoleon with a living standard that the British at the time were objecting to. At the time that he was in St Helena, there was 821 white inhabitants, 820 soldiers, 618 indented Chinese labourers, 500 free blacks and 1,540 enslaved persons. Uh, that's just one connection between the colony and, in effect, the Atlantic slave trade <coughs> that existed at the time. There was, of course, colonial John George Nathaniel Gibbs, a collector of customs from 1834 to 1859. He was a planter in Barbados. And uh, again, uh, a family that did play quite a prominent role in that economy at the time. And I make special mention to him because when he came here, he, he built a house overlooking Sydney Harbour at the time. I heard the real estate was going cheap back then. And whilst you might not know it as the Gibbs House, you might know it as another house uh, called Admiralty House, uh, which is where the Governor General resides. And it's fascinating, again, if you start to think about how connected the colony was to so many of these global circuits, it starts to become quite an amazing story. And I make two mentions of these two particular incidents because, of course, I have two connections to these people. The first is, of course, the very first treasurer was a person tied up with the East India Company. And the 67th treasurer, which is who I am, uh, am the first Australian of Indian descent to serve in the treasury as well. And it's just a marker of how much as a society we ourselves have changed uh, as well. The second thing I make the point is, is that I'm a treasurer who resides in Enmore. And Enmore was named after a plantation in Barbados as well, uh, which was reflected again in, in so much of our geographical naming. Now, this might not be a history which is well told in New South Wales, and it might be a history that we need to tell better in New South Wales, which is why it's so important that we're having conferences like this here today. And indeed, we're getting better at telling our stories, we're getting better at telling our complete history and giving people a much bigger picture of what it was like to be here when our existing political order was formed. That story should be told, that story should be told more, that story should be told more in these conferences. It should be told more by our experts and it's, I'm really pleased that I can introduce to you one of those experts. I'd like to welcome now Associate Professor Carol Liston to take the story a little bit further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those warm welcomes. What I want to look at today, in all this light, <laughs> is perhaps more about the people and the money than the institutions. Because let's face it, when we talk about treasurers, we're talking about cash. <laughs> and that really is uh, the heart of the game, particularly in a convict colony. Um, I'm not sure if you realise just how many convicts were here because they were involved in passing forged Bank of England notes, either in making them, engraving them, or in the case of many women convicts, of passing them in a quite sophisticated trade in Britain. Nor indeed that some of those convicts male and female, were charged with high treason by the British Mint because a popular activity for old ladies in front of a fire was making counterfeit sixpences. So we have a convict population who has a personal engagement, shall we say, <laughs> with the currency of the colony. So, Let's just be clear, we're talking about a prison. The importance of the 1823 Act is to move it on somewhat from being a prison. 
But the British, when they came here to Sydney, were looking at a prison. And that means that our economy and the money and the expenditure was entirely what the British government wanted to spend on a prison. It wasn't about a free economy. It wasn't about uh, creating opportunities for those people who landed on these shores and couldn't go back home. So for a start, we have to have in mind that the paymasters were in London and that the bills were paid for by the British government with varying degrees of generosity, I guess, as their finances changed. And even after the convict system ended in New South Wales in 1840, the Treasury, to the end of the 19th century, would be sending returns to the British government asking them to pay for the imperial convicts. Those people who had life sentences, who were in the prison system, the lunatic asylums or the benevolent asylums. People with a life sentence who were still serving convicts until they died. And we can see those returns all the way through the 19th century. So we're so accustomed, I think, to online and modern payment systems, we've almost even forgotten what a cheque looks like. So we need to turn our minds back to a quite different world. So to pay the bills in New South Wales, the colonial officials drew on the British establishment through the commissariat. And the commissariat was sort of the, a military paymaster. So um, the expenses of the colony were such as um, this treasury bill signed by John Palmer of Waterloo, uh, who was the commissary at this time, and um, drawing on the British government a bill to pay local salaries, in this case for, for superintendents and stockkeepers uh, in the colony. It was treasury bills that were used to pay for the food so that the commissariat would call for fresh meat, for vegetables, for bread, for the institutions, and that would be paid for by uh, these treasury bills. But they hadn't set any cash, as the treasurer said. This is a place where any bit of loose coinage in the world circulated. There was no money. So these treasury bills became quite important for the local residents and merchants to be able to gather together to send to England to get credit in England. Because the problem was you couldn't buy a piano here. You needed to have a line of credit back to Britain and that is what the um, treasury bills provided. But by the very nature of those bills, it also increased the cost for the British government. So there's going to come a point when they say you're too expensive, cut back on treasury bills. But the problem for the commissariat, and I have to say that some were honest and some weren't, um, and uh, that meant that the treasury bills became also a circulating medium in the colony as the merchants gathered them up. So the commissariat often didn't have any idea how much was in circulation. So while the British government was busy with Napoleon and a war, they didn't care much. But once um, Macquarie came and the Napoleonic Wars ended, the constant um, appeal, no, order from the British government was cut back the expenses. So, Macquarie was a soldier, but he also had a sense of um, civic place and he did want to build things. The problem was that the British government only wanted to spend money on the convicts, not really on the colony per se. And so Macquarie is important because of his engagement with the alternative finance on a large scale. <clears throat> 
Um, and part of that backing came from the emancipists, that is, former convicts who had served their sentence and were living here making a future for themselves. Indeed, by the end of his administration, perhaps the dominant economic force. So for Macquarie, he improved, shall we say, a system that Governor King had put in place, which was a system where fines and fees were collected in the police and orphan funds. So that, um, as we've heard from the introductions, that by putting tolls and fees on a number of activities, the colonial administration could gather its own revenue. So the importance of the police fund was it's an incipient colonial revenue. This was money that the British government was not in charge of. And we can see from this public notice in 1810, which is the, the first year of Macquarie's administration, that they publish, it's an open fund. Its accounts are published in the newspaper, the Sydney Gazette. The treasurer is Darcy Wentworth, also superintendent of police and treasurer for the public police fund. But here, it's paying money for wages. It's also paying rewards for capturing bushrangers. So this is a fund that the governor and the administration could use in ways that suited them. But it didn't quite solve the problem of going shopping. And that was when, oh, oops. That was when the police fund started to issue their own notes. So you need some form of circulating medium. And Darcy Wentworth as treasurer of the police fund could effectively um, circulate something that's not unlike, I guess, an old check, that it's worth a pound, 10 shillings. They go down to five, two and six, and the really cheap ones are all endorsed in the back in Latin. And one of the economic historians thought that might stop the colonial forgers. I wouldn't have thought so myself. Um, <laughs> But this is a colony that, as we know, um, has to make do with whatever it can trade if there's no circulating medium. And so we remember uh, here the contribution that Macquarie made, which was to import bullion, to import a large quantity of, in this case, Spanish dollars again in silver, and to punch out the middle of them so that they were no longer um, a circulating medium outside New South Wales. Macquarie's famous holy dollars. And by defacing it, he was hoping that it would provide some type of cash to circulate in the colonial economy. Now, they're now worth lots and lots of money uh, and in museums, <laughs> as the treasurer said. But it was a sign of um, trying to make a colonial economy work that was slightly independent from drawing on the British government with the Treasury bills. Macquarie's other great um, economic thing was to establish the Bank of New South Wales. Um, this was not looked upon favourably by the British authorities, but as far as Macquarie saw it, the local economy had people of considerable worth and by forming a bank, now this is a period the banks are private as we heard yesterday. Lots of private banks were um, being uh, formed, a lot of them in England from ex-East India Company officials, the Nabobs who went home with lots of cash. Um, here in New South Wales, by creating the Bank of New South Wales, he created a local financial institution. But he went further than that by saying that the notes issued by the bank could be counted as proper currency within the colony and that the funds of the colonial government could be put in this bank. 
And that was to cause a lot of ruckus over the next 20 years or so, depending on the stability of the local banks. So, and the bank, we, yesterday we were, heard a little bit about women in colonial society, but it's worth knowing that there were a number of women who were shareholders of the Bank of New South Wales, and there were a number of women who had accounts with the Bank of New South Wales. The population of New South Wales understood the importance of a financial institution like the Bank of New South Wales. Of course, that wasn't just the only source of money, um, barter. And here we are in a building, one of the remaining ones of what was popularly known as the Rum Hospital. And here is Darcy Wentworth's account of how much rum they had the duty on because they built here and the mint because there wasn't money for a colonial hospital. And yes, they did sell land grants for racehorses and bottles of rum. And indeed, Elizabeth MacArthur had to have little pieces of paper to say she'll pay her bills because there was no money for her to go shopping either. So you can imagine how difficult it was. The difficulties of the economy were in fact ameliorated by people with links to India, in the case of Robert Campbell, links to banks in India, and Eba Bunker, an American whaler, because he wasn't a British citizen. He's a very useful man for Macquarie because he could get around the East India Company's rules because he wasn't a British citizen. So here we come to John Thomas Beek and his report. And we heard a little bit about that yesterday. Lynn's paper was particularly important in terms of the economy because she mentioned the petitions that were given to the British Parliament by Edward Eager. Edward Eager was a solicitor and an ex-convict. He had practised here in Sydney until the judges decided that convicts couldn't appear in court. He was particularly concerned about improving the conditions for ex-convicts. And so the petitions that he presented included all the things we heard yesterday were not in that act. A petition for trial by jury, a petition for a legislative council because there should not be taxation without representation. And this formed the content of those petitions that were presented at the time the 1823 Act was passed. And there is a wonderfully... Um, link to the treasurer because of this man. And that was Geoffrey Eager, his son, who became the um, uh, eventually colonial treasurer in the 1860s as a member of parliament. And in the 1870s, he became the first permanent head of treasury. This is the man who is credited with creating the modern treasury. He is the son of the ex-convict. So moving then on to Napoleon that we've heard something about and a portrait of a very young uh, William Balkum, friend of um, Napoleon, particularly with his family because when Napoleon moved to St Helena, there was nowhere to put him, so he lived on Balkum's estate. The family got very friendly, particularly his daughter Betsy, spent the rest of her life publishing memoirs about it. And they were so close, he was sacked for fear he would encourage the escape of Napoleon. The family continued. His great-granddaughter is Dame Mabel um, Brooks, a Melbourne socialite, who in 1957 bought back the St Helena estate in order to give it to the French government in memory of Napoleon. However, here in New South Wales, we were slightly um, less organised than that. And the man who had to deal with the 1823 Act was Sir Thomas Brisbane, soldier and astronomer and scientist. And I really feel for Brisbane because he um, didn't ever know what was happening. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. <laughs> 
the commissariat brought in more Spanish dollars. And that became the currency. And so when Balkum arrived, he had to deal with both sterling and um, dollars. Here is a man charged almost with treason. It was as well that his mentor was the gentleman usher of the Black Rod of the British Parliament. He lived in O'Connell Street, but in fact the treasury was the bottom floor of his house. He needed armed guards and was constantly worried about being um, burgled. His accounts are a wonderful um, insight into colonial New South Wales. He paid for coffins as well as for salaries. He paid for anything that had to be paid for and it was in cash. Most of you would remember being paid in cash, I think. <laughs> and so even his colleague, um, the naval captain, uh, Piper, had a more exotic lifestyle and got into trouble just like him. Now, Cooper and Levy were emancipist traders. They too um, had their own notes. To get money home, they bought a ship and sold it in England because you couldn't exchange overseas. His nephew came back as the first speaker of the Legislative Assembly. So what all of this suggests is that there is a problem of moving money around. Darling didn't like the banks, so he told the treasurer to take all the government money out of the Bank of New South Wales in specie and keep it in his house. Um, this is one of Balcombe's letters that says, uh, respectfully, um, there's no money vaults, there's no cash room. I don't have anywhere to keep the entire cash of New South Wales. <laughs> this is perhaps not a problem you have. <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't tell. <laughs> And that was part of the problem because they didn't know if Balkan was making a bit of money on the side. However, that's another story for another day. Um, Drummond uh, was a man not well liked, but he had to deal with fading banks. And I want to close by suggesting that the money wasn't just about money. It was about a social identity because the names for the colonial population depended on whether you were pure or debased. And so the currency, sterling, was what they called children who were pure of British free background. Currency was what they called the children of convicts. And even in 1830, after Balkan had died, when a convict woman pinched the money from the till in the pub in Windsor, this was the silver that she took from Portugal to Germany to France to England, all of which you could use to buy a drink in a pub. And you couldn't get money home. The saddest story is that of Francis Allman, once in charge of the convict settlement at Port Macquarie, who lent money to some Irish convict mates. And when he tried to send it back to Ireland in the depression of the 1840, he had to buy notes from an intermediary to send back. They went broke, didn't have the money. The relatives came from Ireland and asked for the debt to be paid. And Governor Gipps said, you cannot be in debt. And he had to resign his position. So moving money around was a dangerous game. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, for that fascinating uh, insight and thank you, Mr Treasurer. I understand the Treasurer has to get away in about two minutes or one minute's time. Three. Three minutes' time. Um, can I invite a question firstly to the Treasurer then and then we'll let him go and then there'll be time for a few more questions to Carol. So are there any questions for the Treasurer? The money safe in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> More than one, yeah. I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, Mr. Treasurer, I think this is a sign that everyone wants you to go Please. and do your job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And questions for Carol about that fascinating talk. Yes, in the third row there. Thank you, Carol. That was great. Um, uh, yesterday we learned that not, perhaps not much really changed in 1823. But, and you said, though, that there wasn't to be any taxation without representation. So when would you say that happened? When we get an elected, partially elected legislative council in 1842. So the, the people that uh, Edward Eager, um, Dr William Redfern and the others who were lobbying at the end of the Macquarie period were aware that Macquarie had instituted duties and um, fees, but they were also resisting the role of the East India Company in the Asia-Pacific region because it limited the trading that they could do, and yet Macquarie was still taxing them. So they were very much taken by the American colonists' um, uh, arguments at the time of the, um, their independence. And so no taxation without representation was one of uh, their slogans, uh, as, were, as we heard yesterday, trial by jury that didn't work or didn't work in the criminal court. What we didn't hear yesterday was that it was introduced in the civil courts here in Sydney, in the lower courts. And that created a sort of intergenerational rivalry because anyone who'd been a convict couldn't be on a jury list, but their 21-year-old sons could be. So there's a bit of tension between the old and the new because the people with the money still couldn't be on a jury and their useless sons could be. <laughs> Is there one more question? Yes. Uh, Sam, we'll get to you there. Just a quick question about bartering. Um, was there a kind of a futures market that developed? So you're growing grain out on the Hawkesbury. Um, you could try to you know, leverage that based on what the harvest might be worth. And were, were there kind of disputes about that? Um, yes, uh, often ending up in the civil court <laughs> as people tried to... Um, work out on, on effectively whether their crops would produce what they wanted. And so one of the big battles in the 1820s when the, uh, over a ship called the Almora that um, came into Sydney Harbour, the commissariat had um, chartered it to go to Batavia to get grain of some sort for fear that there had not been enough of the harvest. So anyone who had thought they didn't have much, suddenly there's a shipload full of um, grain coming into the colony. It also came with about 100,000 Spanish dollars in it, in bullion, and was um, hijacked for breaking the East India Company rules and sailed to India, so they didn't have to worry about it landing. So all of these customs of how much money it is. We get dollars coming in when they're worth five shillings each on an exchange, they go out when they're four and fourpence. So all of those um, differing values made life hectic for people like Balcom, um, really difficult. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there, but can you please join with me in thanking Professor Liston for that wonderful talk. <laughs>